Good morning. morning. Buenos dias. Como estas? How are you doing? Good. How are the dads out there? Good. Only hear one person out there, so I guess I guess some dads aren't having it too good this morning. I'm blessed because I was able to wake up and enjoy my family once again. You know, and sometimes, you know, we can take advantage of our families. Uh, we take advantage of the time that we think we have with them, and we don't use it accordingly. And, you know, it's these times that we must remain close to God. And this is a day that God has made for us to rejoice in it. And today's Father's Day, it's fathers, how they always say, unsung heroes. A lot go unnoticed. A lot of work in the background is being done and completed in their lives. Uh, because being a dad doesn't come with a, doesn't come with an instruction booklet. It doesn't come with a, how to treat your wife, how to treat your kids, how to discipline, how to take care of them, how to talk to them. It, it, there's no book written on it. But God that gives instruction to our lives and gives instruction to our hearts, he's the one that helps us to take care of our families the right way. And so therefore, we are being prepared. And this word this morning that God has given me is going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 16 this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 16. And I entitle this message, You Are Being Prepared. Some of you are probably looking at it and saying, you know what, 1 Samuel, isn't that where Goliath and David was? Yes. But God has given, God has many different ways of using this word however he wants to, and that's pretty awesome in how God can do anything that he so desires. So we're going to be going in verse, uh, verse 1 in 1 Samuel chapter 16 this morning, and it goes on to say, now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethamites, for I have provided myself a king amongst his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then, the, then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. Father, I thank you, Lord, this morning for your word. I pray that your spirit goes before us, my God. Help us to grab onto your word as it speaks to our hearts. Let it minister to us, my God. Let your word come out in whichever way you need it to come out this morning. And let your spirit continue just to flow in this place, my God. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. After Saul's disobedience, Samuel was given the instruction to go set and anoint a new king. See, Saul was given specific directions by God to kill the armies, the Amorites, I believe it was, and to just behead the king, to destroy everything that was in sight. This was God's instruction. But what he did not do was follow through with the instruction that God had given him. He had saved some of the stuff. He did not totally kill it off the king. He imprisoned. He did not kill the king as he was instructed. In these times, God, when God said something to do something, it meant to do it. Don't try to say, well, God, you know, this happened and, and this happened. I felt bad. I felt sorry. Because of, of Saul's disobedience, God called upon Samuel and said, I'm going to find you a new king. I have a king in mind, but I need you to go fill this horn so that you, you can go and anoint this one. And verse 4 says, so Samuel did what the Lord said. Of course, he didn't question it after knowing what happened to Saul. And went to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord Sanctify yourselves and come with me to sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. He invited Jesse and his sons to which one would be anointed. To one of his sons would be anointed. So he sanctified them. He set them apart. See, when you're set apart to do something, that means you're set apart to do something. If God has set you apart at one time or another in your life, there's no change in that. You, you're, you've already been given your purpose. You've already been given your direction. 
You've already been set apart. Now the biggest, the biggest question is, are we going to fulfill what God has given us, what God has put in our laps to do? And so this is exactly what, what Samuel was doing. And as he was doing that, verse 6 says, So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him, for the Lord does not see a man as he sees, as a man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. See, the Lord wasn't looking at the physical stature. He wasn't looking at his abs and saying, yes, he has, he has a perfect abs. He has perfect biceps, his, his comb line. He has no calyx. He, has no, he is perfect. No, God's not looking for any of that. Because that's all, that's all fake. That's all something that we look for. It's a physique. It's what we present ourselves to be. But that does not show what lays within our hearts. And see, this is what God is looking at this morning. What is in our hearts? Because even though our hearts could be at a place, God can see the inner roots of our hearts. He can see the things that we so desire that we don't want no one else to see that we desire. And see, this is how God gets us at times. He sees our desires and he's like, you know what? I got you. I'm going to do this for you. Why? Because I want to move in your life. Why? Because I need to open up your eyes. And if it's this one thing that you desire, I'm going to do it for you. Why? Because God does whatever he wants. No questions asked. We can't go negotiate with God. But when God does something in our lives to open up our eyes to it, he's trying to get our attention. See, God has been moving in our lives one way or another throughout these years. Whether it's praying for someone and someone coming up and, and God's just moving on their life. Or whether it's a, a family member for salvation or, or your husband or your spouse or your children, you know, for God to move on them. And God's doing it. God's moving on them. So this is bringing encouragement to you. God is showing you that he is with you. God is showing you that he hears your prayers. That's how good God is. But sometimes, most of the time, we have to have patience with that. He's not going to answer it on our timing. Why? Because if, if, as we were growing up as kids, and if our parents were to give us something that we asked for right away, what would happen? We would become spoiled. Spoiled, rotten. And if we didn't get our way, guess what? We would throw the biggest fit ever. We would throw the biggest fit ever. Without explanation, just because we weren't having it. In Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We can't even compare to imagine how the Lord thinks. He thinks a thousand, he thinks a million steps ahead of us when we have only the th first three steps, if that's planned out for our lives. See, God already knows how our, our lives are going to end up being. He already knows the date and the time that we're going to leave this place. See, God knows all of that. But we use doctors and we use friends and we use anyone else around us to kind of give us the information that we want to hear. But ultimately, God only knows all in all, he's the author of our lives. We even, can't, we even question why God wants to use us or even other people. We, we question God, well, why do you want to use them, God? They don't have it. I, I, I can do better than them. I, 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 I can dress better than them. I, I look better than them. I could stand better than them. I could do all this better than them. Why do you choose them, God? Why must you use them to bring glory to your name? And then we have to think about, well, when did God try to use us? And when did we pass up that opportunity? I bet some of us have passed up opportunities. We want God to use us, but that time he wants to use you in a small way. We refuse and we turn around and say, you know what, Lord, I'm not ready. I'm not, I'm not wanting to. I'm not willing to right now. It's not the right timing. With God, it's never the right timing. You're never going to be ready. 
You're never going to be that person that's going to have all your ducks in a row. Heck, you're going to have some ducks even missing. And maybe a couple screws loose. God chooses who he wants. Well, why are you going to choose him? Well, because look at where you're at. You're complaining about the one that God is using while you're doing nothing. You're just there bickering. You're there complaining. You're there pointing fingers. You're not saying praise God and edifying your brother. You're not edifying your sister. But you're trying to bring down their name. You're trying to bring them down. You're complaining. See, we don't understand why God uses certain people. But yet, at the same time, we don't know what God has been doing in their lives, in the background, to prepare them for this calling that they have on their lives. See, we can't just go up and, and get an education and say that we're done and we're good. That, that's, that's education. That's head knowledge. See, you got to have the understanding of how God works. you got to have the understanding of what it takes to have faith. you got to have understanding to when all eyes are on you and nothing's going right to keep your head up no matter what. Keeping the good faith. Keeping up the fight. Knowing that there's a chance that you may lose it all. That's reality. In verse 8 it says, So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. I'm saying like I know how to say it, right? And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. The Lord has not chosen any of these. So they kept passing by. All of but one of sons, Jesse's sons, passed before Samuel. Maybe he had expectations. Maybe he had some because he didn't gather all his sons. He only gather, gathered the sons that were available. That set their time aside because they were set apart. So they had given up their day. They had given up their responsibilities. They had given up everything that they were able to, to attend this. So that Samuel could identify who was going to be a set apart for the Lord's work. But there was one that kept fulfilling his responsibilities. There was one that kept doing what his father was instructing him to do. And I'm talking about his physical father, the one that lived here on earth. He was doing his responsibilities as he was instructed. In verse 11, it says, And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest. And there he is keeping the sheep. He's keeping the sheep. And it says, For, and Samuel said to Jesse, Send him and bring him, for I will not sit down till he comes here. So he went, so he sent and brought him in. Now he was ready with broad eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. For this is the one. And later, as you would see, God revealed that David had a heart after his own desire. He desired to do right. See, this was the heart of David. Later on, you read that David had the heart after God's own desire. He didn't have a heart of anything else. See, this is what God is looking for this morning. He's looking for hearts that are truly desiring to what God wants to do in their lives. He's looking for this man. He's looking for this woman to come and say, Lord, I desire you, desire you above all things. In Acts chapter 9, verse 15, it says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Go, for he is chosen, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Men, I'm talking to the men this morning. God knows your heart better than you do. 
He knows your heart better than you do. We can't hide behind our hearts. We can't hide behind our attitudes. We can't hide behind our physique. We can't hide behind our mentalities thinking that we're the toughest above the toughest. Why? Because God will knock you down. God will bring you to a place of being humbled. God will bring you into a place knowing that no matter how times we think we can handle things, we need him overall. See, this is how God works. You are that living vessel that will go before people great and small, before the Gentiles, before the religious leaders, before those that are seeking something of God in their lives. Men, I'm talking to you this morning. Why? Because God has set you responsible for your households. God has set you responsible for the upcoming of your children. You didn't inherit them. You didn't win a prize, but God gave you that responsibility. Because your children, those that you're helping to raise, those, those that you're raising, somehow, some way, you're going to rub off on them. They're going to mock you. Not mock, well, they'll probably mock you too when they're angry at you, but they're going to mimic you. They're going to say jokes like you. That's right. My dad jokes don't make sense, but sooner or later, you will say my dad jokes. <laughs> and I'm going to be looking at you like, what is your problem? The shoes will be reversed. So parents and dads, remember that when your kids start making those jokes, just look at them like, that's what I said 10 years ago. <laughs> you will rub off on your kids. The way that you walk, the way that you talk, they will do the same exact thing. Why? Because you're at, you're at home with them more than anyone else, then with their friends, then with their boyfriends, then with anyone else. Now we're going to go move to chapter 17. And this is where the battle begins between the Israelites and the Philistines. Now I'm going to summarize uh, verses 1 through 11. This is where it's talking about how Goliath was looking. This is what it was talking about. The Israelites were on one side and the Philistines were on the other. So you had two armies in a valley that were, faced, uh, that were on opposite sides facing each other. And then you had Goliath, the Philistines' champion, was taunting God's people. Was, he was taunting God's people. And I know I'm going to repeat myself on this, but he was taunting God's people for 40 days in the morning and in the evening. For 40 days, he went out there and, and the Israelites were so scared because of how big he was. He was nine feet tall. He was, uh, man, he was taller than this wall. Imagine me standing up to this guy, big and buff with a sword that probably weighs as much as me. How he can probably just grab me by my ankle, swing me around, and just throw me aside. The Israelites were on one side, and the Philistines were on the other. And here's the champion, Goliath, and he was taunting God's people. But on verse 9, this was his statement. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. Like he had a choice because he'll be dead anyway. But he was fighting for the people. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. See, there's a giant even today that is taunting even God's people. There's a giant today that is out there mocking the name of God. If you want to see it or not, it is real. We have Christians that are professing the name of God from behind their doors. But when it comes out in the public, when it comes out to having to stand up, not so many Christians are being able to profess the name of Jesus. Why? Because of mockery. Why? Because of embarrassment. Why? Because their faith, their security, it's not as strong as they say it is. I'm telling you this morning, 
if a giant came up to your doorstep, let me in. What are you going to do? Your shotgun's not going to work. Your weapons are not going to work. Your knives, your utensils, you're not, you're not going to be able to, to, to feed this giant and give him some barbecue, some carne asada, some. He's, he's, not, he's not a Mexican giant. He's not interested in that food. If he came to your doorstep this morning, what would you do? Picture that this morning. Picture that today. If this giant came up to your doorstep, what would you do? Because I tell you one thing this morning. If you have a giant in your life, and if you don't face him, that means you're becoming his servant. That means you are submitting to his authority. You are submitting to his will. If you're not fighting the giants, if you're not going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the giants, and we're talking about the devil this morning, if we're not facing him, if we're not coming against him, then we're becoming more of a servant to him. We're serving his will. We're serving his purpose. Because it's either you're hot or you're cold. But if you're lukewarm, you can't be between. You can't be between. Because that, that between is the most comfortable place that we can be. Nobody seems to bother us. Nobody seems to tell us anything. Because they don't know what to tell you. They don't know whether to tell you scripture or to come tell you to go smoke a blunt. They're confused themselves. Hey, are you going to church? Are, are you going to church this weekend? Yeah, I am. Okay. All right. Why would you need a... Nothing, we're good. Hey, you going to church this weekend? No, oh, man, I'm not going to church. Hey, we're having a party. You want to come? They know how to play it. They know how to, they know how to play checkmates. See, the enemy works in many different ways. The enemy works in many different ways. He has strategy. We don't want to admit that the devil has strategy, but he does. But this is why we have God in our lives. Why? Because he, he enables us to see ahead. And he shows us the ensnarements of the enemy. Why? So that we won't get tripped up. But we have to face a giant this morning. In verses 12 through 22... David was doing his responsibilities in this. So David was going back and forth as his father instructed to give food to the soldiers to go see how his brothers, he, Jesse wanted to see how his brothers were doing. So he sent David to go see how his sons were doing. Why? Because they were in war. They had to be hungry. They had to be tired. They had to be everything. So as David was going to see how the sons were at, he was going and giving bread to loaves. He was going and giving wheat to those that were hungry, the soldiers, the captains, and whatnot. So he was doing his part. And he was taking care of the people. And again, during this time, this is when Goliath, again, 39th, 40th night, 38th day, whatever the case may be, he was going back and forth again. Telling them, if you can defeat me, then we will become your servants. But if I defeat you, one of you, one of your champions, then you must come and be our servants. He kept doing this. Imagine how the enemy comes in even today. And how he likes to mock the people of God. And how he likes to torment the people of God. And it's not by temptation alone, no. The enemy doesn't play that way. He plays dirty. Well, remember this? Well, remember that? You think God forgave you for this? You think God really forgave you for that? The enemy knows how to manipulate. The enemy knows how to play the game very well. So this is what's going on. The giant, time and time again, is taunting the, God's people, the Israelites. But not one soldier had the courage to stand up against Goliath. Not one. Moving on to verse 34 of chapter 17. Verse 34 says, 
But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered it out from the, and went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and I killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered, delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. See, this whole time, David was just taking care of responsibilities. He was just going as his father instructed him to do. Go and check up on my sons. Come back and give me the report. Go and feed the soldiers for they are hungry and come back and give me the report. See, even during this time, even while David was watching the sheep, he was being prepared. He was fighting off beasts. He was fighting off bears. He was fighting off lions. He knew that God was with them. He didn't even do it on his own. He knew that the Lord had saved them, that he had saved them from the lion's mouth. He gave God the glory in this. So as he was going and he was serving the people, as he was giving to the people, as he was feeding the people, David was being prepared for this moment. And it was at this time when God revealed to him that there was a need. Because all these other times that he went, he did not hear Goliath. He did not hear his mockery. But that moment that he heard, did, that he heard Goliath mocking God's people, oh, no, uh, not today, Satan. He stood up. It was his time. It was his time to stand up. It was his time to hear it. He wasn't looking for it. But God allowed him to see the need. And at this time, he went to Saul and said, I can do this. Saul had no faith in David, but David was giving him his testimony and said, if God delivered me from these beasts, he surely would deliver me from this giant. And see, this is the type of faith that us men should have this morning. If God has brought me this far, he will take me even further along. But God will not leave me right here. He will not introduce himself to me and then leave me alone to myself. No, that is the enemy lying to you this morning. See, when God introduces himself to you, it's for an eternity. It's for a lifetime. It's a commitment to the day death does you part. And I'm talking about from your body going into the ground and into the hands of the Father. It wasn't until later when David was going to stand up against the giants. See, he was being a shepherd during this time. He was doing his duties and going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth over 40 days, give or take. He wasn't going and being nosy. He wasn't going and seeing what all the trouble was. It wasn't for him yet. He wasn't trying to involve in something that he wasn't prepared for. Because sometimes we can get ahead of ourselves. But he was a shepherd to the sheep. He was the one that guarded the sheep. He was the one that provided the sheep with food. He was the one that kept them together. David was being prepared. David was being prepared. And God is preparing us this very day. We, we see all the tasks that God puts before us. And we're kind of like, well, Lord... This isn't really doing anything. This isn't making an impact. I'm not really being used like I want to, and, and, but God's put it on your heart to do. See, this morning we have to begin to look at it. If God gives us even the smallest things to do, that means he's preparing you for something. If God has a calling on your life, he's going to start you from here, and he's going to build you up to here. But see, we don't understand that. Why? For our thoughts are not as great as his. For our thinking is not as great as his thinking. For it surpasses our own understanding. So if God has given us instruction this morning, that means to follow through with it. Why? Because there's something bigger and better ahead of you. See, for David, it took, it took a long time. Even during the war between the Philistines and the Israelites, he still wasn't introduced into the giants. 
He wasn't introduced. Why? Because the Israelites were having a need to face this giant themselves. Think about this for a minute. Keep that in your, keep that in your thoughts right now. The Israelites were too scared, but every day they were being tormented. Every day they were looking at this giant, feeling helpless. Verse 38 says, so Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put on the bronze helmet on his head, and also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he has not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these for I have not tested them, for I have not tried them, for I don't not, I'm not used to wearing this stuff. So David just basically took them off. See, the world will try to give you the best solutions. The world will try to lay on you what worked for them. The world will try to come and give you what's helped them pass by time. But you have to remember, we have to remember, I have to remember that God has already equipped us. God's already equipped us. What we have today, no matter how little we think we have, God has equipped you. No matter how much you really think you have and how much you, you don't think you have, God has equipped you enough for today. See, this is the thing. God's not going to let you go without God's not going to put you out there so that you can get ran over. God's not going to do any of that. But he's given you enough to stand up to your giant this morning. So Saul tried putting all the armor on them. David's like, you know, you know what? It's not going to work for me. So he just took it off. So we all know that from there, David got his pouch. He looked on the floor, and he started gathering some stones. He started gathering some stones to see what he was going to take with him. And the Philistine began to draw near David in verse 41. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And the, when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. He made fun of him, and he looked at him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog? You come to me with sticks, and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Ooh, that was a bad mistake right there. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. He will give you. I did not hear or see nothing about I. I did not hear or see nothing about what I have been raised to do. All I hear is God is going to do it. In God's name, this is going to take place. In God's name, your carcass is going to be on the ground. He did not hold back. He said the same thing to this giant. Oh, you think you're going to get me? I'm going to have the last laugh because my God doesn't know any defeat. And my God abides in me as I abide in him. So you make fun of me all you want because at the end, I'm going to be the victorious one. See, this is the mentality. This is at the hearts that we must carry. Our God that, res that abides in us does not know defeat. He says, defeat, what is that? I went, to, I went to hell and got the keys from hell. They couldn't even hold me back. They couldn't even hold me down. I went and fellowship in Abraham's bosom. Did they try to stop me then? No. They couldn't do nothing. See, this is how much power the name of God has. 
See, the Spirit that resides in us is the Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not something that's, that's carried lightly. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. The Holy Spirit helps us to understand what God wants from us. We have a direct link between God and you, between God and I. I don't have to be left in the dark any longer. I could hear him. I could understand him. He touches my heart and tells me what to do. He pats me on the back. He touches my heart. He speaks to my mind and tells me everything's going to be okay. When you're left in confusion, when you're left not knowing what's going to happen, he gives you that confidence that only comes from him to help keep you going. Because I'll tell you one thing, in our confidence, we only can go so far before someone looks at us sideways and then our confidence just drops to the wayside. Because it's our confidence. It's what we think. It's what we know. And when it doesn't work accordingly, guess what? Our confidence just goes up in smoke or and it just stinks. And everyone else smells it. But when we go in God's confidence, you just go and you do it. And sometimes you do it crying. Why? Because that's all you got. You're giving it your all. And you're just saying, Lord, I'm just broken. Here I am. And this is all I have to offer. And he's like, that's enough. This is all that I want. This is all that I want for now. I'm going to carry you through. I'm going to help you out. See, this is the father that we have. Relent, the love that keeps giving. The grace that keeps us, that gives us sanity, that keeps us 